Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar on wearing multiple hats in the lighting industry presented by Tony Caporelli. My name is Mallory Misnarsik and I'm the project manager here at Herman. A few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during this webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter and we'll try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar will also be recorded and a link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. We encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions workshop series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional Training to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Tony, the presenter for today's webinar. While finishing his degree in electronic media and film, Tony became inspired by concert lighting which led to a 15-year lighting career. He now owns Infinite Box, a production design, programming, and video editing company, and is currently serves as the lighting designer and director for Billie Eilish. And I'll pass it over to you, Tony. Thanks, Mallory. Greetings, everyone. And yes, my name is Tony Caparelli. I'm a Nashville-based lighting designer, lighting director, lighting and media server programmer, and video editor. Wow, that was a lot of job titles, right? Well, I'm here to tell you today that might sound like a lot of job titles, but taking you on extra tasks like these will help you grow in the business. I'm very lucky to do what I love and have traveled the world for the past 15 years, working with acts like Mallory mentioned, Billie Eilish, Keith Urban, Marco Antonio Solis, Jake Shimon Bacoro, Denzel Curry, and many more. With all that being said, I'm very pleased to be here today with all of you to talk about the benefit of wearing multiple hats in the lighting industry. As you can see in this first slide, there are numerous things that I've mentioned that I've done over the years in some shape or form. I hope you come away from this session with a greater understanding of the technology that awaits you out there. And hopefully my words here will help inspire you to take further steps to better your skills while keeping a good attitude. Let's move on to the next slide, shall we? <clears throat> So what does it mean by wearing multiple hats? Multiple hats is just a term that simply refers to doing multiple jobs. As you can see, there's a lot of roles that you can play in the industry. So utilize your initial skill set to its fullest and then expand your horizons from there. I would now like to give you a brief description of what some of these jobs do. Our very first job coming out of the gate that I'd like to mention is the lighting director job. The lighting director should know how the show is going to go from beginning to end. You're entrusted by the designers to keep the show to perfection every day. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. If a cue isn't on time, everyone is looking at you. It's just like if a musician and a band isn't playing the song properly. So it's very important to understand the structure of the music for lighting directors. And generally speaking, no matter what the event, the lighting director must have a thorough understanding of the event that is, deep, that is to be presented for the audience. So it's very, under, it's, it's very important to know your product, no matter what you're doing, whether it's corporate, concert touring, whatever. Um, just knowing the product that you're gonna give the audience and give them the best you can. Let's see, where else? I'll lose my place from time to time, so please bear with me. Um, to execute a show properly, at least in my eyes, you have to have an intermediate understanding of how to operate and program the lighting control board. If you do not, then you could be out of a job eventually, especially if there are any problems you can't help fix with the control programming on the console. Because remember, once the programming phase of the tour is done and you're the lighting director, it is solely on your lap to make sure that the show operates properly. So knowing the console is very key. We're just not required to show up and hit buttons as lighting directors. If you aspire to do that, you could be looked upon as a non-asset to the production. Also, calling follow spots over headset, that's a very important part of the show. We have great tools to help lessen the chance of error with remote follow spot systems nowadays, like follow me or ground control. But nonetheless, we must keep a good eye on the aspect of the show. I'll admit nowadays, I'm able to see the peripheral of the show better by incorporating time code into my show files. It truly allows you to keep a better eye on things instead of worrying about hitting all the buttons on time. Either way, there is a true art to being a lighting director, whether you have time code or not in your show. 
Next, I'd like to discuss the lighting and media server programmers. Lighting and media server programmers, they're basically in charge of delivering the, des the desired visuals for both the designer and the artist. They are constantly keeping their ears open for the detail the artist and the designer want to see on stage, then utilizing their programmer skill sets to emulate the vision with lighting fixtures and media servers. The cool thing is that the programming process for lighting and video, they can lend themselves to each other. For instance, you can review the artist approved video content for the, server, for the media server prior, prior to the programming phase and have an understanding on how you want the lighting to look by seeing the colors of the video content already. But also, it can work in reverse. Working with Billie Eilish, she has a very distinct uh, color palette on how she wants the color be, to be for her songs. So a lot of times, while I'm adjusting a lighting color palette, she may ask the video director, hey, I'd like the content to be this color to match the lighting. So color schemes are very important. It can work either way whenever we're producing looks for songs. Also, the media server can be programmed to accent music with clips or different effects for a song, just like when we have lights flash or change color in the lighting rig. So there can be a trade-off at times where the lighting may accent drum beats and the video might take the keyboard beats. It's really cool how they interchange. I think that's why the programming process is truly one of my favorite creative processes of production, just because of the creativity you get to do with the two. All right, and now a little bit bigger seat to talk about. This is something that I've fallen into in more recent years, the lighting designer. The lighting designer is the chief creator of the lighting visual for the show, but he must also work with many other factors like budgeting, fixture selection, trust configuration, safety protocols, and much more. The lighting designer will start an idea and usually write it down on paper. Then we usually apply it to Vectorworks and have it made into 3D renderings to share with production designers and the artists. It just depends on who's involved, so it can change from project to project. Once the idea is approved by the production and the artist, then you'll want to find a lighting equipment provider by working with the tour's production manager and decide what works within the production budget of the tour. The lighting designer and the production manager must go through all the detail and make sure that the requested gear is available. Once a provider for the lighting equipment is agreed upon, it is now time to start getting, to the, getting the production together. One of my favorite parts. It's, you know, you've just done all this work and all this clerical paperwork, and now you finally start to get to put the creative part together. One of my favorites. Uh, lost my place again. So let's see here. So once you're ready to put the production together, now the lighting designer will try and find his team. So usually a lighting designer's team is compromised of a lighting programmer or two and a tour lighting director. As you can tell by the subject matter of this workshop, more than one job can be handled by the same person. Once your team is put together, it is time to begin the process of pre-production and begin programming the show. After pre-production preparations are made, then production rehearsals will start. And now you'll finally get to apply all the hard work and planning that you did with the programming during the pre-production phase. At production rehearsals, you will then begin working more closely with the artist and their vision. Make sure that the tour is ready to begin by listening to them and all the feedback that they have to give you to make the show as best as possible. After the production rehearsal is finished, it's time for the moment of truth, opening night. It's the most nerve wracking and rewarding night for everyone. You finally get to give the product to the fans and it literally, literally gives me chills, as you can see, just talking about it here. You know, it's whenever we do a show every night, it's the biggest buzz that you could have in the world. So to be able to share that with people for the very first time and share this brand new project, it's, uh, it's quite rewarding for everyone involved. After the show, you finally get to relax and take a small breath, but only for a small time, because now you're going to need to analyze what went right and what went wrong. Then you have to get your team back together, refine and perfect the notes to make the show even better as it moves forward. Then the tour's kicked off and you're on other cities and off you go. Lastly, I mentioned video editor. Um, that was the last job title that I, we had mentioned in my slides um, for my different jobs that I do. I briefly wanted to talk about video editing on a more personal standpoint because I have to express the importance of rekindling your skills that you may have not used for certain projects. 
Some projects call on us to use multiple skills, while others may require a very particular skill set. When I decided to take on my career in lighting, I abandoned my video editing skills from the university training I had taken. As I progressed with lighting, I felt like I would never get to use my video editing skills again. Luckily for me, as technology began to grow in the early 2000s, lighting consoles were able to control video, and I actually began to wear multiple hats. I found myself editing video content for media servers on the shows that I was working. Even during this COVID-19 pandemic, I had outsourced my video editing skills to help nonprofit organizations just to get some practice. So always try to keep your talents refined because they may just end up serving you all again. And eventually that could end, end up being an extra source of income for you. All right. Oop, next slide. So this one's called train, 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 and learn from others. Um, as I express the benefit of wearing multiple hats and doing multiple jobs, I also want to let you guys know that never put too much pressure on yourself to absorb everything at once. Taking on too much can cause you to make mistakes, so always be careful. Once you're confident enough to go do another task, then go for it. If you're not comfortable, then be honest enough to say, I don't know that, but with training, I will. If you're needed to acquire an additional skill suited for a project, you should definitely learn it so your worth increases for the project. But don't let the idea of taking training courses, uh, tra taking training courses intimidate you whatsoever. We have a lot of different avenues for training nowadays, so take advantage of what's out there and get good at it. As you can see behind me, I've got the Grand MA3 and I'm constantly on the lookout for YouTube videos from their, uh, their YouTube channel that gives you different tips and different ways of the developing software. So that has been my thing lately is that I've been really trying to absorb how the Grand MA3 is going to involve uh, their, their new software, how it's implemented, and how I can be efficient with it as the product becomes more of a standard that we put on shows. Everything mostly has online solutions. So even if you can't get your hands on a lighting console physically, definitely use the PC solution. Everyone's got a, usually a PC solution you can download for free. So take that, take that to your advantage. You're obviously not going to be very fast with your keystrokes, but I guarantee you understanding the software interface of the actual product is key. That's going to give you a lot of fundamentals on how you're going to grow with the console or different types of products that you're going to use and apply for your job. So always try to get a hold of that software any way possible because chances are there's a version out there you can get a hold of to learn and start absorbing and getting familiar with it. I guess my key point in the extra studying and training is to show your colleagues that there are more skills that you can bring to the table to their production. You're there to better things in the first place so why not learn a couple extra things to help help propel yourself even more. For me, I believe in showing your additional skills when you are given a correct opportunity to show them to your superiors, to show them, hey, I can do these things. And that can actually lead to promotions in your job and you get to earn other things and you know, definitely source some more income as things grow for you. They'll definitely get to see your talents and work ethic and you'll be more valuable than you realize. But also remember, be nice because there's no room for terrible attitudes in this business. There is someone just as good as you or even better waiting at home, just waiting for a phone call to replace you. Not intently, but because there's a lot of people out there that love doing this job too. So always be on top of your game and try to work your hardest. While getting your proper training is a must, so is learning from your peers. As you can see in the pictures here in my slide, I've got a couple of dear friends of mine and a couple new ones from that I've met over the years that I work with. Uh, at the top is Bobby Gray, the lighting designer and programmer for 311. In the middle, Darian Coop, lighting designer for Lana Del Rey. He also co-programmed, uh, he also, pardon me, programmed the Billie Eilish tour that we just had out recently before the pandemic hit. And Alec Takahashi, a young programmer, lighting director from Thomas Rhett. I recently met him at the Parnelli Awards and he is one of the top talents that I can see rising in this business today. Very good, smart people that are great to have around, that have good attitudes, that can help propel you. You can learn from each other. So young and old, just always remember, age doesn't matter, everyone. Having a unique perspective and skill set is what it's about out there, no matter what your age. 
Younger people will most certainly bring a refreshing, a refreshing knowledge of technology with newer ideals and methods. While us older, older guys such as myself, and I do categorize myself as an older guy now, um, we've been in the field more. We've seen a lot more things happen since we've been out on jobs a lot longer. So there's a lot of advice that we've been able to see on a daily basis on how productions work. But it's also important for us older people to be able to set a good example for the youngsters out there. The young members that look up to us and look for us for advice or how we act around people is very important, everyone. So always try to lead by example, but no matter what you're doing and treat everyone fairly. Next slide is, so how did I start? How did I get into all this mess? Um, I gotta start by saying, don't be afraid to start the bottom. I developed a lot of my initial methods to lighting, just messing around with whatever I could get my hands on. As you can see in the top picture, look at silly 23-year-old version of me running lights inside a van. Yes, that is a Volkswagen van uh, that they made into a lighting control board uh, booth, DJ booth, if you will, at a bar I was at. Um, that's just, I, I did what I had to to get my hands on gear and learn and learn music and just be better at my job. At night, I would run lights for college bands and clubs. I would then, during the day, during my, after my video editing courses, I would then go into the lighting console at my university TV studio and practice with that. After graduating, I began to travel with a local band and moved out to Arizona, where I would then invest in my own gear with whatever money I could scrape together to build my own light show. Investing in yourself is so important in this career, so please save your money, but please be sure to pay your bills and make sure that you eat first. Then you can stash all your money away and then blow it on lighting gear. I can remember the first big purchase I made in my career. It was a Jan's Hog 500. I would save $300 from every paycheck from touring and eventually I was able to buy my very first big boy console in my mind. We will revisit self-investment here once I dive into software and hardware a little bit more during the lecture. But I definitely wanna stress, you're gonna hear it a lot from me, invest in yourself, invest in yourself, invest in yourself. And I can't stress that enough just because this is how you grow, this is how you learn things more, this is how you build yourself. Um, to be able to keep up with technology in the times that are out there. So I'll say it again, invest in yourself. So investing in yourself, you're moving along in your career. And then you get to a point where you say, man, like, I don't know if I can learn anymore. Like I'm kind of stuck in this weird spot where I can't grow anymore. That's never true, guys. If you get stuck in a spot in your career, you can always move forward. Just remember, you're gonna to have to find an avenue and go the extra mile to try and find new things to do and new ways to reinvent yourself or progress in your career. For example, after I've been working in clubs for some times, I, I, I realized that I'd not been furthering my knowledge of lighting equipment. I just knew what I knew and I wasn't getting any better. But what was the next step to get in front of the more advanced equipment I was so eager to learn? Well, the answer was easy. It was the lighting equipment shop. For me, it was called uh, a company called Clearwing Lighting near Phoenix, Arizona. I can't stress how important a shop experience is to understand how bigger shows are truly put together. They are the core, the epicenter of how production works. Equipment shops, uh, vendors, different companies, they're just so important to get in front of gear and understand how this stuff is distributed, prepared, and everything else that it entails going out and making shows happen. Um, and don't make fun of me. Yes, those are par cans in that picture there. So that just also shows my age as well. Um, but yeah, I had to include that because that was us loading the truck one day when I used to work at the shop uh, near Phoenix, Arizona. So you might ask yourself, okay, well, what am I going to come away with from working in a shop? There's a lot of different things, guys. Um, show packaging, you know, pulling and prepping cable, packing cases in trucks. Um, whenever we put cables on lights and extension cables and different cords, there is actually a very detailed process on how that's done and how it's looked upon and prepped and our presentations, everything. It's just like if you're giving uh, my teaching experience right now, you have to prepare for it. You want to be able to let people understand it because we're going to work with stage hands from uh, place to place that 
don't work with this stuff every day that we have to explain how to put it together. So your detail in putting a show together is very important and you will learn that from a shop. Show advancing with clients, paperwork. Um, I admittedly, I'm still working on doing good paperwork nowadays. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a very important part of the process. Um, you're gonna get uh, sheets from your superiors that say, we need to pull this much cable, uh, this amount of light. So knowing what you're bringing to the show is very important, guys. So um, knowing your paperwork and being very thorough with it is very important as well. And you can learn the basis of that at a shop. Show rigging and safety. Um, lighting hoist for motors, uh, that hoist truss up in the air with lights attached to it. You're gonna understand a good amount of show rigging and what's safe and what's not safe to put in the air. Um, definitely things to consider because we, we obviously see a lot of accidents in our industry. Uh, a lighting shop will definitely teach you the right and wrongs on what to look for and what to do and what not to do whenever you're putting these very expensive yet possibly hazardous shows when we put them up in the air. You know, all, all safety measures have to be accounted for whenever we do this. Um, and a shop definitely does that as well. They implement the safety first and foremost. Um, gear repair, you're gonna learn if a moving light breaks, you're gonna know what to look for, um, different things to fix. It's really important knowing these things because something breaks, you should know how to fix it. It's just that simple. Also, um, you're gonna just basically learn how to be an electrician as well. You know, there's different types of power that we use around the world. Um, in the United States, we're typically tying into three phase electrical uh, tie-ins, uh, either through a building or a generator. Um, in, in foreign instances, there's different voltage that we use for different power situations. So it all applies the same. So having a, a definite knowledge of electricity is huge um, and how we definitely distribute it properly so we don't overload anything or break any lights or cut the building power because we use too much uh, because it wasn't considered. Um, knowing lighting fixtures, their features and requirements. Um, you know, you're gonna learn how to address a moving light, you know, the specific channel that you have to give the moving light to communicate with the lighting console. Um, the mode it uses, you know, there's different features that each moving light has. Um, You'll be taught about that on how moving lights work within a shop. Um, also, eventually you'll probably get some console programming time. If you're an aspiring lighting control programmer, um, you will get some console programming time, but do it on your own time. When we work at shops, the most important thing is getting the show out the door to the client in a timely manner. When you have a lunch break or if your ship's done for the day, Go to your shop manager and just say, hey, you know, I'm trying to really work on my lighting control board skills. You know, can I grab a desk and learn it for a while? And they'll be cool with it. You just got to do it in an appropriate, respectful time um, if you aren't tasked with doing that job for the day. Obviously, I mentioned safety protocols whenever we're rigging and taking things up in the air, uh, weight constrictions. But there's also safety protocols due to weather that you're going to learn about, too. Um, we also hear about stories about collapses um, from just things being overweight and, you know, just proper accidents. Rather, you know, nature is a whole other being, you know, winds taking down structures. There's been several accidents that we've seen over the years where, you know, weather has been a factor. So we know there are different safety protocols that take place when the gear could possibly be a hazard to everyone on stage when to get off stage when a bad storm comes. So there's a lot of different things that you'll get to learn there as well. And I think respect is another thing. Respect is, is it, I feel like it's such a paramount thing amongst just not yourself, but the others you work with. Um, treating each other with respect and working for a common goal. You know, it's teamwork. It's teamwork out there. You have to work as a unit and a team or you're not gonna get a lot accomplished. So. There's a lot of things, like I said, that you will come away with from uh, working at a lighting shop. So with all the things that you'll learn, you're definitely gonna apply that on a daily basis out in the field. It'll be like second nature, I promise you that. There's things that you'll think to consider. You know, for me as a lighting designer now, um, the one thing that I try to consider is, you know, okay, with rigging and weight constrictions, like how big do I want my idea to go? You know, you try to think of the most limitless possibilities that you can 
and make the biggest, coolest thing in the world. But in reality, is it doable? Is it safe? You know, there's a lot of things that you have to consider before you commit to putting this on paper. Um, and I'm never telling one to hold back, but you've got to do it within a reasonable, um, a reasonable fashion just because you don't want to cause a safety issue or be told, hey, that can't work. And you just told an artist that you had this great idea and you want to do it and now we can't do it. And then you disappear, you disappoint the person that's paying you to be the designer for them. So you really got to try and, um, and be realistic when you're approaching this with artists. Um, cause you don't want to upset them because you've now just had to change the product that you just sold them. Um, your paperwork has to make a lot of sense to interpret something. I, another thing I still practice this day, um, my lighting crew boss from the lighting equipment company, he's in charge of making sure the lighting rig goes up in an orderly fashion. So if you create paperwork hardships for him or her, it can slow the build process and cost the production extra money and labor for the show's setup. You never want to do that because that's truly looked upon. We always try to save our client money. We just aren't there to spend it up on labor bills. So always try to be considerate of that whenever you're working together with your teammates and how precise uh, your paperwork is so everyone can interpret it well and uh, work to a common goal as a team and uh, make everything go up quick. Another benefit of shop knowledge is being able to spot lighting fixture problems like I had mentioned before. Listen, we work with electronics. It's what we do. Electronics will have problems every time and you should know what to look for when there's a problem. This example is more suited for the touring line director. When a moving light is having a particular error, it is extremely helpful to have the knowledge to know what a moving light error is, whether it's a color flag, a bad pan or tilt belt, or whether a lamp just needs replaced. The sooner you can report a problem that you see to the lighting rig, the quicker the crew can begin to fix it, instead of going through the process of elimination, especially if it's during the show. Having this knowledge will gain you a mutual respect amongst the lighting crew for knowing the gear, and you'll have a good intuition for spotting, spotting problems to keep the lighting rig efficient. Every show is expected to have a system at 100%. Most artists and upper managements are very keen on noticing if parts of the production aren't functioning. And it is our responsibility to either have a very functioning system, or if it's not, we gotta have a good reason on why it's not functioning properly. So I've kind of discussed being a lighting director, understanding the shop, um, and now I'm moving more of the, okay, now you want to try programming out. You know, this is the next step, being a lighting programmer for a production designer. Um, for me personally, after I got some more experience in the field, I believed it was my time to step into the programming world, or so I thought. I logged quite a bit of hours on the console, but this is my first time programming for a production designer. And he keeps telling me about this thing called Vectorworks. After he explains the necessity of having the program, I later purchased it and became exposed to an entirely different world of lighting design. But I want to put that on hold for now, and I'll talk about that a little bit later once I revisit software. At this point in the lecture, this is where I'd like to tell you about learning from your mistakes to save your job when you make a mistake. Once, I completely screwed up my tracking sheet in the lighting console's programming during rehearsals, and I had a bunch of missing values in my control board from the programming. I was too worried about getting the look that, the, that was desired during rehearsals for the production designer, rather than using my presets properly, and I paid for it by getting yelled at by the production designer and management when the scenic elements of the shows weren't lit properly. If you can actually see in the back here, we had some scenic elements in the back here. They covered up these tubes at one point, and we had a bunch of up lights. That's where I paid dearly and didn't have my, uh, my presets done properly. I, uh, I didn't give you a picture of what it looked like with, without the correct preset focuses, but um, I'll just be brief in saying that it wasn't pretty. Um, and it's a lesson we should all learn, guys. Um, I'm not saying that everyone should get yelled at or be in trouble for making mistakes, but when we make a mistake, it's a very important part of what shows your character on how you're going to move along and pass a mistake and be better at what you do. Um, and that's what I did. You know, I, I, I got in trouble. I got yelled at. It happened. So what now? You, you go and get better. You make it your mission to correct your errors, improve everyone that you want, that you want to be there and you deserve to be there. 
Frequent shortcomings will be the end of you in this business. So you've got to be prepared to prove yourself constantly. It is just the nature. If you want to do this, that's just how things are usually in the field. Improve myself, I did. Before the next show, I sat at a lighting company in New Jersey and went through the entire show's tracking sheets and corrected my programming. I couldn't have any more big mistakes because Madison Square Garden was our next show in New York City. New York City shows are typically the biggest shows we'll do in the United States. So to be brief, the show went great and I finished the rest of the tour of success and earned back some trust from the production team and the artist management. Because if I did not do good, I probably wouldn't have had a job and I probably would have been sent home and would have been not good and you would have been looking for a new job. So it's good to recover. It's good to prove your value that you want to be there and just be better at your job. Okay, so now I'm going to get back into Vectorworks and ESP Vision and media servers and all that other stuff. Um, so as the experience level came to me, after gaining more experience from a couple different tours and other events as lighting programmer and lighting director, I did find myself facing a hardship I hadn't expected yet. It was during the recession era in 2008, and I couldn't find any work. It was my first taste of rejection in the business, not due to my skills, but because no one knew my name. That had to change. So what do you do? You go move somewhere that has a good epicenter for the work that we do. My natural choice was Nashville, Tennessee. I had a few friends already living there, and they encouraged me to make the move. So I did. Progressing in your career means taking chances, guys. Taking this chance was the best decision I've ever made in my life, and I encourage you guys to take chances. You're never really gonna grow unless you don't. So always try to take chances. If it's what you love, if it's what you believe in, it's something that you feel like you can do, take that chance and I guarantee you'll never regret it because I did. So during this period, in my, I, this is when my personal investment in Vectorworks and ESP Vision became very crucial because I began to understand truly the power of pre-production by doing my own paperwork with Vectorworks, programming virtually, and also using the screenshots from my programming for client renderings. So I could show the client what their product was gonna look like. Vectorworks and ESB Vision have both come a long way over the years. Back when I started to do previs, I was using DMX to USB dongles to bridge consoles universes to the computer. As time went on, networking really began to take shape. When we were able to stream multiple universes over the ethernet with protocols like streaming ACM, it has only gotten stronger, and as time went on, especially with more modern applications like fiber, it got faster. The newer fixtures meant more channels, which meant more universes, which meant more parameters and the need for more network processing. So I feel like as our technology has evolved, there's just been a need for more and more and more. So uh, keeping up with all of that was always uh, a big thing because if you didn't have the amount of parameters or network processing, you don't, you're not able to program a complete rig offline. So always remember that you've got to have the necessary protocols in place to be able to program everything. I remember the first time opening Vectorworks and not feeling too intimidated. The interface felt a lot like Photoshop's where you could grab different things from different tool menus. So I wasn't too intimidated. What's really changed for me was the rendering time. We were very blessed to be in an age where rendering projects has become a lot quicker. I remember when I was at university and waiting for my After Effects projects to render literally overnight. I literally had to go in with a hard drive, let the project render, come back the next morning and hope that it was finished before I had to get into the class. So guys, be very thankful in the era that we're in because it's much faster than what it was for me when I was younger. Um, also, the abundance of lighting fixture libraries in Vectorworks and how they've translated with other software was also a huge improvement. In the past, if I've exported any projects from Vectorworks to ESP Vision, you had to have a plugin for Vectorworks to export it, and it had to be an ESP fixture library or it wouldn't recognize the lights in the pre-visual software. As you can see behind me again, Nowadays, uh, we're using a process known as uh, MBR imports. Uh, our communication process between programs is definitely improved immensely, and we also see a lot better graphics in our projects today. Um, MBR definitely has become what I like to call a turnkey operation, where I just basically described when I was doing imports and exports uh, from Vectorworks to ESP Vision, there was a multiple step 
process from when I used to do it uh, at an earlier age before obviously the technology evolved. And now we've just basically got one thing where we export, import, it's there. Um, obviously the processes are still being refined because it's quite a new technology. But um, as you can see, um, a lot of my geometry, if you can see well, um, a lot of my geometry here came over from the vector work. So my trusses, my catwalks, my stage, my lighting fixtures, the band members, that all came from Vectorworks. I didn't have to place anything separately. So um, it's, you know, obviously as we grow with technology, what's the main thing we want to do? We want to be able to work quicker. Um, so protocols like NVR are great protocols that help us work quicker. Um, and they're just going to get better in time. And it's just a, a very cool era that I look forward to seeing grow um, and become more efficient and just help us be better and work quicker. So um, yeah, so there's that. So um, as I lean into the whole media server portion that I was going to uh, talk about in this, um, I, I, I want to attach a story with it. So after I moved to Nashville, I began to search for designers that I was looking to just meet up with and see if anyone else was trying to find any other aspiring designers and programmers to work with. I eventually found Jeff LaValle, Darian Coop, and Daniel Schultz at 44 Production Designs. Through working with them, they would then lead me to my first country music job with an artist named Gary Allen. When I was interviewing for the job, I spoke with the production manager about what my responsibilities would entail. And he said, you'll, have to, you'll, you'll definitely get a technician. He'll look after you. The rest is up to you. When you have a guy in a, in a camp, you have to do it all. So we want you to know the media server as well. It's like, do you know the Hippo media server? I'm like, Hippo media server? Do we got to go to the zoo? I had no clue what the product was. And turns out that uh, after I did my research, I said, okay, well, it's, it's a VJ media server. It acts like a moving light, basically, except we get to do stuff with video instead of lighting. So um, after doing some homework, I got the general understanding of how the product works. And I asked the production manager to arrange some time for me to get more familiar with it so I could get some practice ready uh, to be ready for production rehearsals when they came up. I figured it couldn't be so bad. You program the media server pretty much like you would a moving light. What I mean by this is, for instance, a media server layer that plays a video clip from the media server can be assigned an address and a fixture ID, just like a lighting fixture would be. And you can patch it into the lighting control console. Think of it like this. One layer of media equals one lighting fixture. If you want eight media layers, then you'll patch eight media layers into the lighting console. If you want to move the position of the light or the video clip, you know, X, Y, either way you want to move it, it's just like if you're controlling the pan and tilt of the moving light. If you wanted to adjust the color of the media layer, it would just be like adjusting the color in, uh, in the wheels and everything like that on the console to adjust the color like you would a light. So once you start to familiarize on how these things are, the programming process begins to be quite fluent at that point. Even with the emergence of programs like Notch, we are able to incur, uh, pardon me, incorporate them into the media server for real-time 3D effect control. But don't worry if you aren't making a bunch of money and can't get a hold of these programs right away, away. There are still these little preparatory dongles that you can purchase that aren't as expensive as the physical server itself. Um, you won't have full capability, but you'll have enough to be able to prepare for your tour. Um, whenever I was media server programmer for Keith Urban's Graffiti U Tour, um, I was able to obtain a, a hypnotizer uh, dongle, just a little USB dongle you can plug in. It activates the interface. Um, this way I could work on my pixel maps. I could work on uh, different video layouts and uh, notch integration into the media server. There's a bunch of other stuff that I got to put in there and be prepared for before I showed up to uh, pre-production uh, programming with the production designers uh, with my buddies Fragment9. Um, they basically gave me a list of things that I needed to make the media server do. And having this dongle, this prep dongle that some of these guys make, um, you're able to actually efficiently build everything before you get to the programming phase. So when you're there, I mean, you'll have some tweaks to make better or, you know, adjust, but you'll be very close and where you want to be uh, doing your programming process. So it's very important to have those things. And again, invest in it. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, so uh, there's that thing, invest in yourself again. I, I just, it keeps coming back around. I guess maybe I should have relabeled this, uh, this webinar, uh, invest in yourself rather than wearing multiple hats, but we'll call it a code name, invest in yourself. So moving on, um, let's see here. Early works. Okay, so for the next two slides, I kind of wanted to show you how my work has evolved over the years with software. Um, the first slide is comprised of works I performed in Vectorworks and MA 3D software. On the left is the 2011 design of Gary Allen. At the time, I relied more on renders I could get out of ESP Vision. But, I was also, but it was also right around the time when I made the jump to the Grand MA family and lighting control consoles. And I began to see the amazing work, uh, 3D work that Early Bird Visual had been doing with the MA 3D software. I was then inspired to do the same with my renderings. So I packed the bag for a brief visit to Act Lighting in California for some training. And there I would learn some more capabilities about how the MA3D software would behave and what my limitations or expectations to uh, do that sort of work with my lighting renderings with. The staff at Act Lighting was so very helpful. When I came away with that, I even came out of it with some new programming tips from my friends Will, Kat, and Spencer. So after the years later, I designed a festival lighting rig for Lady A. And as you can see on the right, I began building 3D projects in much better detail directly through Vectorworks and MA3D. So that was a summer festival package that I had designed uh, with some risers, um, some video walls in the back, vertical trusses with some lights on them. Um, and here's more of the schematic from Vectorworks. So, um, as you can see, the detail increased the more I started to understand what the product can do. Then uh, we'll fast forward to more recently, uh, 2019, 2020, um, right here. Um, if you follow me on social media at all, you'll see the red picture with the uh, invisible staircase and ceiling in the room there. That's for the uh, Phineas Blood Harmony tour we did. I believe it was last year in November. Um, Production designers Moment Factory brought me on to do lighting design with them, and they came up with this really killer concept of having, like, we call it the, uh, the invisible room, if you will. So, um, as you can see, the emergence of technology with wireless LED. You know, we don't see any wires attached to those fixtures there. Um, it, <laughs> it looks like it's just free-floating in air, and that's the point of it. And that's the beauty of technology of what we have at our hands nowadays, is to be able to create really cool looks like that. Um, so I'm very thankful for Moment Factory for including me in that. And also with, uh, with the Billie Eilish tour you'll see next to it, um, we, only got, <laughs> we only got to unleash the lighting rig for uh, three shows, unfortunately. But, um, you know, working with Darian Coop and Moment Factory and uh, my friends there, um, we were able to really come up with a really cool, complex system with some catwalks um, and a lot of wireless tubes, if you actually see here in the green picture. Um, those are all Estera Titan tubes. They're all wireless um, on the railings there and on the bottom. So we have this really slick kind of futuristic look on the, uh, the catwalks. And that's just a quick lighting render up here that I shared with Moment Factory on just pitching the design idea on what I'd like to do with moving light trusses and the, uh, the Titan tubes on the, uh, the catwalks. Um, so uh, all in all, you know, it, the workflow and everything is always going to be advancing. It's going to be sleeker. There's going to be newer toys that we're going to get every year. Um, and, you know, that's the product. And I'm just very blessed to have been able to be included with some of these projects with some very, very, very brilliant minds and, um, you know, just keep on grinding, as they say. Um, some more inspiring words I'd like to share with you. Keep going. Don't stop. As you can see, as time went on for me, the jobs came. I have a wealth of knowledge from great people and continue to absorb as much as I can. It gets harder when you get married and have children as I do nowadays, but when there's a will, there's a way. It's so cool to see how far software and hardware have come nowadays. My favorite thing right now is watching what the people are doing with the Unreal Engine software. It's so neat and innovative, and I hope to be able to implement it some way or shape or form in a project I'm working on in the near future. At the same time, it's almost overwhelming the rate of new technology that is presented to us nowadays. I came up in a booming era of technology, and I now get to see a younger class of, business, of the business coming up with the most relevant technology. 
Thus, there will be new programming trends and other approaches that we may have not considered using before. So with that being said, don't be stubborn in just having your own ways that you've learned things in the way you want to do them. Adapt to others, because I guarantee you, you're going to learn some new things. So keep going, keep training, and keep investing in yourself. It's so important to keep investing in yourself. Have I said that a few times already? Yes, I have, because you should. <laughs> so I just want to send a quick thank you to everyone. Um, for all the people that I've been involved with over the years, um, there's some pictures here from the Billy Eilish tour we did in 2019, which really obviously helped give me a great boost in my career. Um, special thanks to Core Design and Fireplay uh, for having me be a part of it and let me help take care of Billy Eilish and grow my career uh, through them. Um, some very incredible people to work with and obviously comics, my friends at comics in the UK, um, uh, in London, uh, doing such beautiful content you see back there. Um, it's just been nothing but a blessing. So never forget the people that have taken you under the wing. Um, Roy Bennett, anyone else that I've worked with, production designers, Moment Factory, um, just always remember to thank the people that have gotten you where you got, guys. Um, never forget the people that have uh, given you a chance. Um, Nook Schoenfeld, the editor of PLSN Magazine, always told me, he's like, always be ready to give someone a chance because someone gave you a chance. So always be humble, guys, and treat people with respect and just work hard, okay? Um, I'd like to send a very special thanks to Brad, Mallory, Laura, everyone at Martin Professional, everyone at Harmon, and all of you to allow me to talk today. Um, it has been really cool to share my journey, and I hopefully I've taught you guys a, a thing or two on just what cool things we have out there and how to behave and have fun and do what we love. Um, just remember with the right knowledge, attitude, and work, work ethic, you'll go a long way in this business. Uh, that's what my peers have always told me. So please, if you can take anything away with you today, um, always have the right knowledge, attitude, and work ethic, and it will take you far. Um, and before I think I pass it back to Mallory, um, what I'd like to do before we get this uh, Q&A going is, um, today is a very, very special day in our industry. Um, as you guys have probably seen on social media or all over the place, um, we make events. Um, I'd like to just take this time to just tell you all about it. Um, as you're aware, around the world, we haven't been able to resume concerts since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Many of us remain unemployed and in our dire need for aid from our governments. Therefore, today has been chosen as the official day to make our voices heard. There are a few ways that you can help this cause. You can write your governing representatives, light up whatever you can in red, like your home or your office building, or make posts on, of your creations or maybe someone you're inspired by in the color red on social media like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram with the hashtags, we make event and red alert restart. Uh, restart, pardon me. Um, all the hashtags are up here if you look in the slide, guys. And then at the bottom of uh, the website is wemakeevents.org and you can learn about it uh, there a little bit more. So if you guys can take the time to write this down and blast social media with it today. Um, this all affects us in some sort of capacity. Everyone's situation is unique. So I definitely encourage everyone to get out there and make some posts today and make our voices heard because our, our governing bodies need to hear our voices uh, and our call for aid uh, and to possibly resume things and maybe get back to doing some normal concerts again. So. Um, Again, uh, thank you guys, and remember your voices are important today and greatly appreciated. Thank you. Hey, Tony, we did have a couple questions. Okay. So I'm gonna start with this one. Um, what's that magazine you just mentioned? Uh, you just mentioned one a couple minutes ago. Which magazine? Oh, mm -hmm. um, Pro Lighting in Town magazine, uh, PLSN, is that it? I believe that was it. Yeah, um, hold on, let me see here. I had just lost my slideshow, I apologize. I did so good on everything up until now. <laughs> there it is, okay, apologies guys. Perfect, um, so we did have a couple more questions if you have the time. No, okay, I, I, I absolutely do. Uh, pro lighting sound, uh, pro, lighting, uh, pro lighting stage news, uh, projection stage lighting news, good lord. Um, 
that PLSN.com, if you guys want to check that out. It's a great magazine where everyone in the industry really gets to share their works uh, around the world, uh, not necessarily just the U.S., but everywhere else that's doing uh, doing any sort of production. Uh, it's where I got my first start, just being able to write and share my works with people and let them know what I was up to. Great. Um, the next question is, as a young person in the industry, what's the best way to make meaningful connections? Uh, well, I, I kind of take the old school approach, guys. Um, my father would always tell me, he would say, you know, if you went out and looked for a job and asked someone about it, you know, and you don't hear anything, always just keep checking back in. Now, not to be like, an, not to be in a nagging sense, but it's always good to just kind of just, like I said, uh, keep walking, uh, knocking those doors down, you know, um, eventually they're going to open for you. Um, so always be persistent. Persistence is key. Um, checking in with people. And if you feel like a, a route's blocked, think of another way, you know, if maybe there's someone you want to try and work with directly that maybe isn't letting you in there, look for other people that do the same thing. You know, there's a lot of people that do production in the world. So just because your avenue might be blocked on where you think you should be going, you know, you could totally lead to something else. I mean, for me, you know, uh, part of my story that I shared is that I started in video. I had no idea I would be in lighting. And so for some reason, I took the lighting avenue and now I'm here 15 years later. So you never know what you can ride into, but be persistent and just keep doing what you love. And if you got to go another route, um, Social media is a really big thing nowadays. Share your work on social media. Share your aspirations on social media. Um, and just compile a list of different places that do production, names around you that you, you know, aspire to work with. Or, you know, like I said, you never know who will give you a chance. So don't ever quit if you think that you're not getting anywhere with it. Just look somewhere else and just keep digging. Great. The next question is, how would one who's been away from the industry for a long while get a jump on professional networking, portfolio building, learning new technologies, especially um, since we're not working? That is a really good question. Um, I would, I guess it would be, you know, think about where you left off. So, you know, start from that point. You know, so, okay, so when I left, where was I at with my career? What was I doing? And then try to harness that and move forward with what you know. Always take what you know first and then move forward from there. Uh, one part of my lecture, I talked to you about um, taking advantage of software. Um, so if there's a particular thing like that you liked, maybe it was um, lighting programming, for instance. You know, get a hold of the Grand MA2 or 3 lighting software online download it um, and get to know it. Um, like again, there's all sorts of help videos online, whether you go to YouTube or whatever, and get a notebook. I, I, it's so funny, hold on one second. I have a, uh, an age old notebook here. I've kept for most of my career. I have about stacks full of papers about this high, and it's from stuff that I didn't know. Um, it was things that I got online, I learned from others, and I kept a journal of all the things that I learned over the years. And you should do the same, man. Um, try to write down as many things that you can absorb. And it will all kind of stay in there in some way. You know, God, we, 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 have, we all have brains up there that can absorb knowledge. So just always keep absorbing, keep building. You have to build up to where you left off, right? So always just keep taking that as your, your place setter and going from there. No matter what you can do, just keep writing it down and, uh, you know, you'll get the knowledge, you'll get to where you're at. So you got to believe in yourself and just stay on everything that's out there. And uh, pick a particular topic that you're interested in. So if it's something that you like, like I, I stress in my thing, it's good to know multiple things, but pick what applies best to you first. Grow with that and then other things can come along as it goes. Perfect. The next question is, anything that you wish you would have done differently along your career path? I'm a firm believer in karma, I guess we could say. So, like, if I would have done something differently, would I be sitting here as the line designer director for Billie Eilish? You know, like, I kind of think about it. It's like, I think there's this kind of, this, I don't know if it's a destiny or whatever, but I don't think I would change anything except I would have 
I would have just taken advantage more of things that I could have had. Like maybe, maybe there was an opportunity to learn something that maybe I passed on um, that I could have taken an opportunity to learn. I, I do, I do look at that as missed opportunities if there's something that I, I could have bettered myself with. So I guess the answer to your question is any opportunity that you can get, take it, take it. If you're married and have children, make your loved ones understand that this is going to be beneficial for us. I've had to do that. I have a three-year-old son and a seven-year-old son. I've been married for almost 10 years. So, um, you know, you have to, you know, people that know you, they know how you deeply feel about something. So just go for it. Don't dismiss any avenues, anything that opens up, take it if you can, because you never know what could lead to. So just don't ever stop doing that. And, no regrets, no regrets, because again, if you did something differently, it could, it could alter the course of maybe the, where you're headed for your career. So um, just take advantage of it as much as you can and no regrets. Great. The next question is, what do you think is the best way to transition from the lighting crew to programming slash designing? That's an awesome question. Um, you know, it's more so, uh, man, there's so many other guys that could answer that question better than me that have been a part of the lighting crew and been very successful directors, programmers, and designers. Um, but the best way I can answer it is um, start getting in front. So, like, if you're on the lighting career, uh, if you're on the, the lighting crew and, you know, you're working, obviously, besides the, the directors and programmers and designers, um, Try to try to you know show them let you can help a little bit. Like a lot of times, like knowledgeable crew members that know the lighting console well, they're always offer an opportunity to say like, "Hey man, I can reset that fixture for me for the console if you're busy programming something." So don't ever hesitate to show them the skill set that you can bring. So if you have an opportunity to say, "Hey, I can get on the console and do this for you if you're busy," you know, don't step on their toes, but try to be helpful. Try to be helpful and show them because. There's a lot of times like where people have done that for me on lighting crews and I've kept them in my mind and saying like, you know what, they know a console, like I could put them on a job because they obviously show that they're, they are sufficient in, in their knowledge of the console that I would be comfortable in using them for something. So if you never take your opportunity to show them that you can do that, you'll never transition because they're always going to think of you as a crew guy that's just there to set up lights. Whereas if you had more to bring to the table, Try to take your opportunities to show these production designers or the guy that you'll, you'll more than likely be working closer with the lighting director, but show the lighting director. Like I'm, I'm always looking for people that can show me those sort of things. And, uh, you know, you know, if I get a job offer somewhere and I can't go to it, you know, and you're sitting there and you have the knowledge, I'm going to say, Hey man, I got a guy for you that can do this. So always take your opportunities and, and show, you know, show, show your skills off if you can, anytime you can. Perfect. This next one isn't a question, but more of a plug. Um, it's Canadian Day of Visibility for Live Events. Uh, yeah. Workers is September 22nd, and the website for that one is www.liveeventcommunity.org if anyone wanted to look into it. Of course. I am right now. I'm writing it down. <laughs> there are a couple more questions. Um, so the next one is, do you have a preferred media server? Does the answer change with scale of show? And does the answer change between MA2 and MA3? That's a good question. Um, if I had my weapon of choice for media servers, it's just because I've worked on it for so long, um, would be the uh, Hippo V4. Hypnotizer V4 would be the one I would normally advance for a show just because I know how to pixel map it. I can you know, in integrate notch into it. I can do a lot of uh, of the cool things that I can do. Uh, I had a lot of good friends like uh, my buddy Simon Roberts and Corey Froke uh, teach me a lot of, uh, of hippo stuff. So I've been able to ascertain a lot of knowledge of that over the years. Um, but I will also say that you should never limit yourself to one media server because a job could come up where you maybe, especially nowadays with COVID-19, I'm doing a, um, a live stream event where we don't really have the budget to go rent a, a hypnotizer for the event. But on my, my laptop here, I have Resolume. So I could take Resolume and integrate that with the lighting system and playback video clips. Um, if you guys check out my Facebook page, I think I've got it there. I'm at, at Squint's floor on social media, so 
feel free to add me. I, I welcome all the ads and everything like that. I love to have you guys. Um, you'll see like some of my streaming events. I'm just I'm playing content through my laptop on Resolume, uh, and it's networked through Artnet to my MA3 console, and I'm playing back video clips. So I guess the answer to my question is like, don't get too comfortable with one thing. It's good to know a few of them because obviously, if there is a job that comes up that says, hey, you know, if you're a hippo guy and the job's for Resolume and you don't know it, you know, it's always good to, you know, delve in a couple extra uh, software, different softwares. But um, MA2 is definitely the way to stay right now. Um, if you want to work on an MA3 uh, but in two mode, you can totally do it. I've been working on shows still in two mode for a while. ME3 has been a, a learning process for me. I know some people are doing shows successfully and with time code on it. Um, I'm just not in that position yet to really just dive in and go for it. I'm, I'm faster on AMA2 software and getting around on things where I'm waiting for a few more things to be implemented on uh, the three software side of things. So I would stay to software, but um, like a lot of the people at Act Lighting are gonna advise you, um, get to know the MA3 hardware while you can. So, you know, use the MA3 uh, console if you have the opportunity to, but keep it running in two mode because the protocol is safer at the moment. Um, the software side of it, pardon me, is safer at the moment and more stable for shows. Um, and Hypnotizer is my, my favorite, but like I said, don't get attached to one thing. It's always good to know uh, a few others if you can do it. Great. The next question is, if you had to pick only one hat to focus your career on, which one would you choose? Ooh, man, that's a good question. Whoever you are, that's very good. Um, I gotta say, I gotta say lighting director. Only because uh, I think for me personally, I, I just love being a part of the show. Um, once you become like a full-time programmer or a full-time lighting designer, like all the time, um, you, you're, you're not, a, you're, you're part of the show, but you're not there. You're not on the road with it constantly, you know, the, the touring lighting director is the guy taking care of the show night in night out. And that's what I live for. That's my favorite thing to do. I think programming a show or, you know, programming content or doing a lighting design, that's just a bonus perk that I've just earned over the years to be able to do as well. But I still just want to be a road guy because I love taking care of the artist. Um, that's always just been a passion of mine. Just the buzz you get from all the live concerts with all the people screaming, the nerves of it all. <laughs> as you can see, I got a lot of gray hair, guys. So just be, be prepared, you know. Gray hair comes with the territory if you want a job like that. but. I wouldn't trade it for the world, so I would say lighting director only because other things will come in time. But if you truly love the show and love being out with it, you can always be a lighting director for a touring show. And all those other things, like I said, are just perks, in my opinion. Great. Um, so we do have a couple more. So the next yeah. one is, what is a recent skill you have learned that has benefited you greatly? Recent skill that's benefited me greatly. <laughs> just looking in my office for something. Um, I would say um, getting better at um, making my own custom models for MA3D. Um, I've been working on just like a project where I can kind of just do some designs and just do some practice. Because, I mean, the one thing, guys, during this whole COVID-19 thing, even if you're not working and you have the opportunity to practice and get better, look at some things that you might not be as sharp on and, and try and attack those things and get better with them. You know, for me, uh, I couldn't free draw, like, if I, if I wanted to kind of have, like, a big squiggly um, set piece, for instance, like, and customly make that, you know, uh, you don't just simply apply that through MA3D, you know, you have to, for me, I, I would go into Photoshop and free draw out the shape that I wanted. Then I would have to take the shape and then eventually throw that, uh, that picture into Vectorworks and then make it into uh, a 3D surface. And I didn't know how to do all that with custom shapes yet that I would create, but I did find a way to do it uh, through Photoshop and import it in Vectorworks and then make it into 3D shapes. So making my own, 3D shapes for lighting design has definitely been a newer commodity for me that I've been enjoying greatly. Um, 
getting, again, getting grayer hair from it, but I definitely am gonna benefit from it greatly um, once I sell more designs with custom shapes and custom looks to be able to, you know, step outside of the box from the normal uh, rudimentary objects that we see in a lot of lighting design, you know, uh, where we can make it abstract and different at times. I think it's newer to the eye that we see as an audience, you know. I don't know about you guys, but I love still going out and seeing shows or even the streams right now and seeing, you know, what people are up to, you know. And, and I try to actually say, like, well, what haven't I done yet, you know, is always the thing. So always try to keep that in your mind. Like, what haven't you done yet or what you can be better at? So 3D objects or custom 3D objects are my new thing now. Great. So how important is it for a lighting director or programmer to understand vector works? Paramount. Uh, again, like as I shared in one of my stories there, uh, the production designer just like mentioned it to me and I'm just like, okay, you know, I'll go get it. But I never had a clue on like how important it is to share the work and understand like, okay, you know, if you know, uh, there's a certain thing that the designer's trying to get you to understand and see through their drawing. Um, knowing that program is is key because you're you know, you know how they layer sheets and everything like that. They're going to give you perspectives and different books to look through. And it's good to share just not only for you as a light director or programmer, but for your lighting crew chief and the other members of your team. So everyone has a general unified understanding of product rather than just the lighting designer just trying to it's tough you know even for me because I, I still have to practice as a lighting designer nowadays it's like how i can convey my vision to people just vocally you know some people can listen to what i say and understand it perfectly other ones are like geez tell me what the um open up vectorworks and have a more visual interpretation so i think vectorworks is just so key because it gives you the true visual interpretation that you need to understand the lighting rig as a programmer as a director where lighting fixtures are at because me as a designer i can say you see these lighting fixtures on the stage thrust right now, this is what they're intended to do versus just describing it to them and then not seeing a product at all. So, um, and I'm a very, very, uh, a very, very huge visual learner. I know a lot of people are too. I guess if you, you wouldn't be doing this if you weren't a visual learner. So um, it's, it's, it's very, very important to implement that, you know, for a unified understanding for your whole team, not just a few people. So. Great. So the next one is what software should I learn first? Programming, drawing, visualize, visualizers, or media servers? Programming. Uh, programming first for me because you're not going to be able to do any of those other things without being able to program. Uh, I mean, drawing is one thing, but just take this with the best intention I'm trying to tell you is that not one person that isn't, unless you're well known and you've been like, a lot of people started out as board operators, you know. I, I, one guy I'm always inspired by is Roy Bennett. Um, he was Prince's LD for the longest time. And I would see pictures of him, you know, at the lighting console, uh, you know, back in the day, his hands on the console doing the, doing the console work, you know. And this is before he became a world-renowned lighting designer for some of the most beautiful shows that we see out there uh, nowadays. Um, so you always have a start on your roots from somewhere. And I think it all leads back to the console for me. Uh, and I think a lot of other guys would agree with that statement as well. So I would learn the console. I'd learn the programming side first, because once you know the programming side, then you're going to be able to implement that with visualizers. Then you're going to implement that with media servers. And then drawing comes in there eventually as well. You know, it, it's all kind of like a slow burn on how you kind of slowly evolve into all these other different types of software. But programming is the at the center of it all for me. Great. So it looks like we have two more questions. So the next one is, what is the best way to get jobs in venues outside of your network or local area? Um, man, um, you know, I would, Everyone that kind of has like local social media pages, like social media is such a powerful tool. That's like one thing I kind of always fall back on. So if there's like venues that, you know, don't have like a direct line of, uh, direct line of communication for them, always try to like hit up the Facebook page or just direct message them on like Instagram. 
and try that route because a lot of times, you know, if you're sending an email to info at, you know, club.org, you know, for example, they're not going to answer that a lot of the times, you know. So, and a lot of times it's, it's just knowing your networking of people. So, you know, it, like for me, I know that if a lot of people I know in Nashville, like, oh, I know so-and-so that works down this club, like contact a, a, a person that maybe has some connections around town that you're aware of. Um, and reach out to them and, you know, they can plug you into the social pipeline with some of those venues. Um, and venues are important, you know. Um, that's how I, I got my start in a lot of local bar club theaters. And, you know, and sometimes, to be completely honest with you, I'll give you a funny story right now. Whenever I got my very first lighting gig ever, I was, uh, I was still at university. I was a senior finishing up. And... I love live music, so I said, okay, well, I'm going to go apply for this music venue job because I just want to be a part of live music there. They put me on the security team, so I'm with, like, a bunch of rugby players and, uh, like, uh, uh, and Marines. I'm, like, the most standout guy. I had longer hair and a beard. <laughs> I did not belong on that security team, but I'll tell you, the – being a part of it, eventually the production manager said, hey, you want to make a quick 60 bucks tonight? You know, we just need a guy to go run the lighting board. And sure shit, I was I was a security guard, not even thinking about running the lighting board, and I ended up having to run the lights for that, and it never changed after that. I did go on the lighting board, and he said, oh, you want to keep doing it for bands that don't have a lighting guy? And, and that was really the spark that started it all for me. And it wasn't even an intention to get on the lighting board right away. It was just like, I just wanted to be a part of live music. So consider it this way. Maybe if you just don't get a job directly through the venue uh, or a production job, you know, go be. I, I don't want to, you know, deflate anything, but maybe try doing like, you know, a bar back job or something like that or working with, you know, a certain aspect of the venue and tell them what you can do, you know, and then you might be able to speak your way and job like that. It's really just, you know, a coin toss, you know, and if it's meant to happen, great. And if not, then try the next venue, you know, so, you know, because the venue might already have that position covered. So um, always keep your options open because you never know what can fall in your lap. Great. So we have one more question. Um, what percentage of your income do you put towards investing in yourself with purchases of software and devices? For me, it's always been a third, I guess I would say. A third or a quarter of my income, only because, like, let me retract that. Uh, because there's two different needs of when I was investing in gear. You know, there was pre, before I was a father, you know, and after I was a father, you know. Uh, part of my speech, I'll, I'll bring up again that, you know, investing in yourself is very important, but you have to take care of your life and yourself first, you know, don't make yourself starve. You know, that's, that's not worth it because you're saving up for a piece of care. It will come eventually. Just learn how to just balance your money and how you're going to invest in, you know, it might just take a few months longer to get it. Um, but make sure that you're, you've got a roof over your head, especially nowadays with everything going on, take care of yourself. Um, but for me, it's usually like a third or a quarter of what I'm, I'm doing income wise. And I just put it in a little savings account that I have. I don't touch it unless I absolutely have to or if it pertains to business. Um, and just you keep keep showing away. You know, you'll get there eventually. You might be like, oh, I'm still like a thousand dollars away and it's going to take another four months. Well, if it's four months and you can still live okay. Then so, you know. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Tony, for your time presenting. This was a great session. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Perfect. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Bye, guys. Thanks, Bye. Tony.